It is such a joy to be here with you today. Every week you guys put me on the spot with Q&A and I do my best to respond to every question on the moment. And sometimes I think I get it wrong. And so I'm going to correct something I said last week. A question was texted and said, what's the difference between a covenant and a promise? And I gave an answer and afterwards I just kept thinking about that and said, I, I don't really like the answer I gave. And then I got into Romans in preparation for today and realized, actually, my answer, not only I didn't like it, it was wrong, and there's something better here. So what is the difference between a covenant and a promise? A covenant in Scripture is always two-sided. There are two parties involved making a commitment to the other uh, under the obligation of death if they fail to honor the covenant. A promise is always one-sided. One party promises to another regardless of what they do or how they act. Now, the beautiful thing about covenants in Scripture is that God says this is punishable by death for breaking, and then God himself offers the death necessary that we don't need to. But with a promise, no matter what we do, because it's not about us, it's about the one making the promise, God is always faithful to his promises. And as we continue in the book of Romans and we see what Paul is writing to the church that's divided and torn apart, deciding who's in and who's out and how do we know what God has done as Paul is writing this letter, spelling out the work of God, today we're going to get into a promise God made and his faithfulness to that promise and what that means for you and me. If you recall, in the beginning of Romans, he sets up his letter to the church explaining why he's coming to reveal the power of the gospel for salvation for all. And then he continues by describing that in this world, everything was made so that we could see God for who he is. But in our sinfulness, we took everything that was made and turned it into our image. And rather than worshiping God for who he is, we began to make gods made in our image like us and worship what made sense and felt right to us. And as a result, everyone has sinned. And then Paul, he continues in chapter 2 and he says, because of this, no one is without judgment. We're all guilty. And he talks specifically to the Jewish Christians in Rome. And he says, if you think being Jewish makes you anything different, you're missing the point. And this is where the covenant came in because he talks about the covenant and the seal of a covenant, specifically circumcision. See, in the Old Testament, circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign of God's covenant to him. An outward, visible sign that every time they saw it, they remembered what God had spoken and the mutual agreement between both parties. And for the Jewish people at the time Paul's writing, this meant they were something more holy or more righteous or more special because God had chosen them and given to them his law. This is what I expect of my people. And Paul says that's not at all the case in fact, God shows no partiality to anyone who is within the covenant or outside of the covenant. God is fair to all and gives to all equally. This is where we pick up today as he continues his argument describing this righteousness that is being right and in good standing with God as he's describing what this looks like. We're going to begin today in Romans chapter 3. If you'd like to follow along in the Blue Bibles, that's on page 1,174. If you brought your own Bible, uh, you'll have to figure that out on your own. But 1,174, Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He says, look, this Old Testament law, it's not of no value. It points us to what God was doing in Jesus. The righteousness for all. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Paul, he's writing to the church. He says, look, we know now that God's righteousness is revealed in Jesus. God's right standing, the goodness of God, is made known to us in Jesus and is made available because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us will not measure up. Sometimes this is really hard to hear because it's natural, I believe, to look at other people's sin and see them as worse than me. Certainly, it's easy to look at other people's sin and say they are the problem. But it's really hard to look at what we say in our confession that we justly deserve his present and eternal punishment. See, I think most of us don't actually believe that we deserve punishment. Certainly, maybe it's going to happen, but we don't deserve it. God wouldn't do that to somebody like me. I'm a pretty good person. Paul, he says, this righteousness that is made available for all through Christ is because we have all sinned and fall short and are justified by his grace as a gift. Especially here in the South, grace is a word that's thrown around quite a bit. And I think it's really hard to understand what grace is. Because we hear it so often, it sometimes becomes a really cheap grace. A grace that says, I'm forgiven, therefore whatever I do does not matter. And in a couple of chapters, Paul actually directly speaks against that understanding of grace. But there's three big important words. In Scripture, there is a reality that God is just. A just God will always restore what is broken, will always give back to the one who has caused harm. He will always bring justice where there has been injustice. And this just God will give you and I what we deserve. Justice is getting exactly what is owed. Mercy is another concept throughout Scripture. Mercy, unlike justice, is the exact opposite. It's not getting what we deserve. When we deserve to be punished or deserve a consequence or deserve something bad, instead, we don't get that. And grace is something altogether even better because grace is a free gift. That's getting something you don't deserve. Where mercy simply spares you from the harm or punishment or problems you deserve, grace is something above and beyond that. Several years ago, I was teaching this to a bunch of junior high students, and one of my friends was running the sound in the back, and and afterwards, he came up to me and he punched me right in the chest. I said, ow, what was that for? And he goes, it was grace, a gift you didn't deserve. I said, I don't think that's what I meant, but thank you for that. You see, God, when he gives grace, he's giving to you and me something that's entirely unmerited. Every one of us has fallen short of his standard, fallen short of perfection. Every one of us is broken. And so we can't look at the person to our left or to our right or behind us, or the person not here but outside these doors, or the one we walk by at the store, we can't look at our coworker and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Because that's not at all the case. It's this free gift that has been given, this gift given in Jesus. Paul, he then asks this question in verse 27. What then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Paul, he writes, he says, you and I have no ground to boast by the things we do. 
There's nothing we can stand on and say, well, I'm doing a good job. Now, don't hear me wrong. You can do good things. In fact, you should do good things. But all of those good things that you do carry zero weight with God. None. I, I learned the painful reality of grace several years ago. My dad had a good friend all the way through high school and college and most of his adult life. A good friend who I just remember growing up was always there at random times, even when we weren't expecting it or ready for it. And this good friend going through some really unhealthy uh, situations began to become a really bitter and unhealthy person and began to say some really terrible and hurtful things to my dad about my mom, to my mom about my mom, to my parents about our, our whole family. And finally it got to the place where my parents said, this is not okay, and we've set boundaries enough times. We need to tell you you are no longer welcome in our family and in our house. And a couple years went by, and we hadn't heard or seen from him, and my grandpa passed away, and this man came to my grandpa's funeral. And I preached at my grandpa's funeral, and afterwards he sent me a scathing Facebook message. I mean, pages long, all about how disappointed my, my grandpa would have been in me, how I dishonored him, just completely tearing me down for the way in which I preached at this funeral. I was cut so deeply to the core. Here's a man that I really didn't know outside of my dad's friend who just felt he had the right to tear me down entirely. And my natural self did what I think most of us would do. I sent him a really ugly response, and then I blocked him on Facebook. Because isn't that the way you respond to problems? You just cut him off, and then it's not your problem anymore? And I was really struggling with this for a long time. And several weeks later, I received at the church I worked for, a written letter from this gentleman. Now, I'd never talked with him about the church I worked for, so he'd done a little bit of digging and research to find it and find the address and send me a letter. And I, knowing the letter would just trigger more anger in my heart, I handed it to a coworker without even opening it. And I said, will you read this? And if there's anything I need to know, will you share it? Otherwise, will you just get rid of it? And he read it. And he said, I don't know what's going on, but you don't need to read any of what was in that letter. I got rid of it for you. I said, thank you. And I was just really, really hurt and angry, and I wanted all kinds of justice. I wanted this man to get what he deserves. I wanted him to reap all of the consequences for the way in which he had hurt me and my family. And I was talking with a friend who reminded me of grace. He said, Adam, you want to know what grace is? It's standing face to face, face to face before God beside this man and having no harm or hurt or bad feelings in your heart, but celebrating that God would love a sinner like him as much as he loves you. And that cut so deeply. Because it's easy to think about God's grace when it applies to me getting something really good I don't deserve. But it's really, really painful sometimes to consider somebody else getting something they don't deserve. And yet this is the good news that we have in Scripture. God is impartial. He freely gives to everyone apart from what we deserve. Later I saw a meme, and by later I mean like a decade later, almost just a few months ago, I saw a picture online and it really st uh, struck me. It said, imagine all the martyrs who stood at the gates of heaven to greet Paul when he entered in. That's grace. If you don't know Paul, he killed Christians. He made martyrs before becoming a Christian himself. This gift of God is not so that we can boast in ourselves. So we can see just how good God is and how much he's willing to give. There's no limit to his grace. There's no place in which we've overdrawn our account and he says, sorry, too much, you're out. He keeps giving over and over and over again. And just when we think we've got everything we need from him, he gives us even more. And part of the reason he gives us this abundant grace 
This love and this forgiveness and this healing and this restoration, all of these things he pours out is so that in us, it would overflow through us. So that as we receive abundantly his grace time and time and time again, God, I don't deserve what you're giving, but you're giving it freely. Life everlasting, not just eventually when I die, but like here and now, you're giving me an invitation to experience your peace and your joy and to get rid of my shame and my guilt and to live free. And as we receive that over and over and over again, it changes us that we can freely give it. I asked somebody this week, how are you doing? And, and my, the response was, it's too long to text. I'll send you an email. And in the email, there's something I, I think is lovely. Every one of you should hear. I've, I've told you before about how frustrating it is when people run out of blinker fluid and don't know how to use their blinker. <laughs> Said, you know, next time somebody cuts you off in traffic, just imagine they really need to go to the bathroom and wish that they make it there on time. I was like, well, that's a good attitude, right? That changes the perspective a little bit. You're more freely able to say, you know what? I, I get that. I've been there. I hope you make it. And you're less angry and bitter and more kind and prone to give. And when you are able to see God's grace given to you over and over and over again, you're able to then give it to others as needed. Now, Paul, he continues in this whole explanation. He's describing this gift given by God that none of us can boast that is entirely his doing for our sake. In chapter 4, he continues. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, for Abraham, the reason Paul jumps from the circumcised and those who were Jewish to Abraham is Abraham's the father of the Jewish people, the one to whom God first said, be circumcised as a sign of this covenant. But even more than that, Abraham existed some 400 years before God gave his law to Moses. So if they boasted in the law and said, it's by these works and doing what is right that we shall be saved, he said, well, then what about Abraham who came before that? How could Abraham then be saved if he didn't even have that law? And he says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And I just love the subtlety that Paul throws in there. If your faith is dependent upon how good of a person you are or what you do, the only gain you have is to boast before other people. And you gain nothing before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God... And it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul, as he's unpacking even Abraham, he says, look, if we earned anything from God, it's not a gift. It's our wage. We are owed this. He goes on later in chapter 6 to say the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn from our sinfulness. But this free gift of God is eternal life. Not in the future, here and now, life with God. But Abraham is an interesting fellow. If you aren't familiar with Abraham... In Genesis chapter 15, this is where God gives a promise to Abraham. He says, here's the deal. I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and I will bless you abundantly, and the whole world will be blessed because of you. He says, look up at the stars and see all the stars in heaven. You will have more descendants than that. But the interesting thing in Genesis 15 when God gives this promise, before the covenant is made, that happens later, 
when God gives this promise to Abraham, Abraham has zero children and is quite old. In fact, in Genesis 15, Abraham stops God and says, God, this sounds awesome, but how can this be when I don't have any children and the heir of my household is not my child, but a servant in my household? And God says, look, I will do this for you. This is my gift. This is something I am doing. And it says that Abraham believed and it was counted to him righteous. Before Abraham ever did anything, before he went out and was circumcised like he was told, before he went out and didn't believe the promise God gave and had a child with his wife's servant trying to make God's promises true on his own, before God came to him and said, offer up your firstborn son in a sacrifice, and then before God rescued his son from that sacrifice, before Abraham did any of the things he did, it says he believed and it was counted to him as righteous. And I love the story of Abraham for you and for me because it's easy to idolize these characters of faith from the Old Testament and to look at how great and how glorious and wonderful they were. But it's counted to him as righteous and then he goes and sleeps with his wife's servant to get her pregnant. And then he goes and screws up and doubts if God is going to be faithful and again questions and laughs at God when he says this will be the case. Sometimes we think that faith and doubt are opposite. But I actually think that doubt strengthens our faith. Faith is trusting in light of doubt as opposed to rejecting because of it. Abraham filled with all kinds of doubt and still prone to sin and get it wrong believes God and it is counted to him as righteous. For you and for me, there are plenty of times to question and doubt the promises of God. Jesus said he was coming soon and it's been 2,000 years. Is he really coming back? He promised that in his kingdom there would be healing and restoration and yet we continue to see war and violence and injustice. We continue to find people hungry and families torn apart and people sick without answers. It's easy to question and to doubt what God has said. Faith does not expect you to have all the answers, but to place your trust in a God who does. God, I don't know, but you do. I don't understand, but you do. I can't fix, but you can. Faith is not getting it right. It's trusting in the God who has. Paul, he continues a little bit later in verse 16. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. I love the language Paul uses, and it's easy to just jump right over. The language he uses here, that it's guaranteed to all his offspring. It's like the language we would use in a legal document where there's a guarantor, one who is responsible for the thing to happen. The one who's taking ownership and saying, this is my burden to bear. Look, this gift of grace is guaranteed by him as the guarantor. The one saying, I will take this upon me that you will have this gift. In hope, he that is Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. 
No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he, gave, he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. I love how Paul describes that he did not waver in faith, even though we see in Scripture he often got it wrong. He didn't waver in faith, but he trusted, he hoped against hope. See, there are all kinds of situations where in our own understanding, there is nothing to hope in. In our own efforts, in our own pursuits, we look and say, I don't see how this is possible. But he hoped against that. Against all the times that would arise and say, I can't and this won't. But you will and you can't. You and I also it says, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus Christ. If you're filled with doubt, confusion, if life is not yet as it should be, all kinds of questions and chaos, even people in your world that you want to smite if you have the power and you don't know how to forgive and love anyway. If you find yourself struggling, what now? In the midst of your pain, we have the same hope that Abraham has. God is always faithful to his promises. And we can hope against all hope when all odds are stacked against us. God, it's not about me. It's all about you. And I love how it says this, that he, he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Do you find yourself at times struggling to believe? God, I want to believe, but help my unbelief. Do you find yourself at times struggling because you believe, and yet it seems like nothing ever changes? You pray, and they don't get answered. You wonder, and you don't know where to go next. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. For you and for me, this message Paul continues to unpack in the rest of this letter. As we give glory to God, God, it's not about me. It's not about being better than my neighbor. It's all about you. As we give him the praise, you are faithful when I am not. You are enough when I fall short. As we turn all of our troubles, instead of complaining, we turn them to God and we just surrender and say, these are my burdens, God. But you can handle them. As we trust in what he has done for us. And hope against hope. It's counted to us as righteous as well. So if you're here today with doubt and shame and guilt and confusion and hurt and questions and all sorts of what if and what now, Jesus can handle it all. And he will be faithful to the end to all the things he's promised, regardless of your struggles and your doubt and all of your sin. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. That in this book of Romans, you reveal to us this good news that it truly has nothing to do with us. That you are a gracious God, willing and able to give what we will never deserve. Life everlasting. To give your own son unto death. God, that you are willing to give even before we can ask. We ask this morning that you would give to us more of your grace. Grace to believe, to hope against hope, 
to give glory in light of our doubt. God, grace to know that you have loved us and we can love those who have wronged us. Lord, we pray today for those who are sick and in need of healing, for Laura and Ezra, for Kelly and Kylie, for Kira and Kathy and Sue. Lord, we pray for Geneva and for all who are battling cancer. God, would you fill us with hope that your promises are always true. Lord, we pray for those who are pregnant and those who have miscarried and those who long to be pregnant. And like Abraham, may we hope in the things we do not understand. Lord, we pray on this cold weekend for those who are cold and those who are hungry and those without shelter. Would you provide for their every need? God, we pray for your church, for your people all across this city, this state, and this nation, and this world, for those who believe in the God who rose Jesus from the dead. God, teach us in all things to be faithful, to not boast in our works or our efforts or our wisdom or our knowledge, but to boast only in the faith that we have in you. God, now we pray together with one voice as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we continue our worship today, we're going to continue by collecting an offering. If you're somebody who calls this church your, your church family and your home, and you came prepared to give today, if you prefer to do that with cash and check, you can do so in the black boxes as you exit. Uh, if you filled out one of those teal cards that says connect at the top with a way we can be praying with you or connecting with you, you can place that in those boxes as well. And if you're somebody who prefers to do everything online, you can fill out the connect card there online by clicking the little teal button in the bottom corner. You can also make a gift at thepointknox.com in the same place, click on the same button. There's easy steps to follow for how to do that. As you give today, whatever you give and however you give, know this. We give not to get God's love, but because we already have it.